Today on The Matt Wall Show, according to the latest data, nearly half of Gen Z has been diagnosed mentally ill. How and why is this mental illness epidemic happening? Also, a major financial scandal involving one of the biggest Democrat donors in the country. Plus, is the woke brigade still in charge of Twitter and church attendance has yet to climb back to pre-pandemic levels? Will it ever, is the question. And finally, the NEA Teachers Union claims that teachers know and love their students more than their parents do. We'll talk about all that and more today on The Matt Wall Show. Roe v. Wade has been overturned, and this battle is now finally leaving D.C. and going to the grassroots. No group in America is better positioned than 40 Days for Life uh, to deal with that. With about 1 million volunteers in 1,000 cities, 40 Days for Life holds peaceful vigils outside abortion facilities. They have a larger presence in blue states, with California being their largest state. Some former abortion facility directors say that these vigils can cause the abortion no-show rate to go as high as 75%, which is detrimental to, detrimental to their abortion business, to say the least. These law-abiding vigils have closed many abortion businesses in America, and nearly half of those closed abortion facilities were in liberal cities where abortion will remain legal, including closures in San Francisco, Chicago, and Seattle. 40 Days for Life is effectively changing hearts and minds in the grassroots to end abortion. And uh, you can find out more if you check out their locations, podcasts, and free magazine at 40daysforlife.com. Remember that especially now, um, after the midterms and everything that's happened politically, it's more important than ever to stay engaged in this fight. And to do that, you got to get more information at 40daysforlife.com. Uh, Again, that's 40daysforlife.com. In the days after the election, there has been a lot of talk about the Democrat Party's dominance among young voters. And indeed, they did, in fact, dominate. Republican House candidates won the 45 to 64 age bracket by 10 points. They won the 65 and over group by even more than that. No surprise, given that the Democrats spent the entire you know, COVID uh, uh, pandemic trying to murder the elderly. But that edge disappears in the 30 to 44 demographic, where Democrats had a slight edge. It's almost 50-50, though. And then there is Gen Z, which Democrats won by nearly 30 points. If the exit poll data is any indication, nearly twice as many in the 18 to 29 group voted Democrat as voted Republican. So that's Gen Z and like the first part of, you know, the, the, the uh, later parts of, uh, of the millennial generation as well. It's no surprise to learn then that Gen Z is extremely mentally ill at least according to the latest study, uh, which uh, we get this from the Christian Post. It has the report. Nearly 70% of Generation Z, people born between 1997 and 2012, say their mental health was adversely impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic, with 42% of adult members of the cohort reporting that they have been diagnosed with a mental health condition, and many of them say they are worried about the future. A new study from the data management firm Harmony Healthcare IT shows. The study, which is based on a survey of 1,055 Gen Z members from the ages of 18 to 24 in September, included 47% men, 45% women, 6% who identify as non-binary, and 2% trans-identified individuals. According to the report, some 57% of Gen Z adults struggle with their mental health uh, and reported taking medication to alleviate their condition and uh, paid an, an average of $44 monthly. The most frequently cited conditions were anxiety and depression, which were reported by 90% and 78% of respondents, respectively. Other conditions reported include ADHD, 27%, PTSD, 20%, OCD, 17%, eating disorders, 14%, and insomnia, 12%. Less than 10% reported uh, more diagnoses of bipolar disorder, uh, uh, addiction and substance abuse, and borderline personality disorder. While only one in five reported going to therapy for their mental health and um, spending an average of $149 monthly to do so, 87% of them found it helpful. Okay, so nearly half of an entire generation now qualify as mentally ill, according to their diagnosis. When you break it down, the numbers seem to become even more troubling. 20% of that group allegedly have been diagnosed with PTSD nearly 20% with OCD, 14% with an eating disorder. I mean, these are staggering figures. And however we make sense of it all, it's clear that something is very wrong here, to put it mildly. So how do we make sense of it? Well, to that end, I'll make three points. There are a lot more than three points worth making here, but uh, these are the three things that I'd like to focus on right now. First, mental illness is a real thing. There are legitimate mental illnesses 
that people suffer from. But the only way you end up with half of a generation diagnosed mentally ill is if the definition of mental illness has been steadily expanded so as to include everyone or as close to everyone as they can get. As I've warned for years, the so-called mental health industry has a vested interest, an obvious financial interest to the tune of many billions of dollars in finding, labeling, and medicating as many mental illnesses as they possibly can. We're at a point now where you know, every emotion you might experience, every fear, every anxiety, every uncomfortable feeling or thought has been turned into an illness or the symptom of an illness. The human condition itself has been medicalized. And Gen Z has grown up in a culture where every inner experience outside of the norm, however the hell the norm is defined, is considered a symptom of a mental disease. They have been conditioned to seek the solace of a mental, of a medical diagnosis. And so it is uh, no surprise that they have sought and found so many of them. Now, does that mean, just so I'm not misunderstood here, does that mean that the mental illness epidemic in young people is fake? No, it means that it's manufactured, which is certainly not the same thing as fake. I mean, it's, there's something real happening here but it is manufactured. Eventually, the entire generation, I mean, literally almost all of them, if these trends continue, will be diagnosed mentally ill. And although many of these newfound mental patients never should have been diagnosed to begin with, they will increasingly become as mentally sick as the medical industry says they are. It's a self-fulfilling prophecy. Why is that? Because they're not given the tools to cope with normal emotional and psychological experiences. They are made to rely on medication. They are made to feel helpless, like they simply cannot control their own minds or their own emotions or how they respond to those emotions. And the sicker they're made to feel, the sicker they'll become and act. I mean, think of all the people in Gen Z saying they have PTSD. You know, PTSD is something we normally think of, uh, of uh, you know, people, uh, veteran, combat veterans coming home from war and, and think about all the things that they've experienced and seen, and they're suffering from PTSD. Now, that makes sense. You've been in a, in a truly traumatic environment. But to have 20% of this group saying they have PTSD, these, are, these aren't for the most part combat veterans we're talking about. And yes, they've been through some difficult things. The way that we handled COVID was, was absolutely inexcusable, of course. But post-traumatic stress disorder? These are, many of them, people living very comfortable lives. So where does the PTSD diagnosis comes from? Come, come from? It comes from kids and now young adults who have not been given the tools to cope with any difficult emotions at all. They just don't know how to deal with anything. And so any challenge at all becomes traumatic. And now they're now suffering from PTSD. Again, it's manufactured. There is an enormous generation-wide epidemic of Munchausen by proxy happening right now. That's basically what's happening. Speaking of which, the second point is that gender ideology is, without question, one of the primary driving forces here. This is something that conservatives often get wrong, I think, because they confuse the chicken with the egg. It's not that so many in Gen Z identify as non-binary or trans or whatever because they're mentally ill. It's rather that so many are mentally ill because they have been given these identities through peer pressure and the powers of social contagion. The adolescent girl who first begins to fall into the trans trap, she's not sick. There's no mental illness driving that. At least there doesn't have to be. But once she falls into the trap completely, that is when the mental sickness begins to form and take hold. So for a good example of this phenomenon, here's the latest uh, TikTok innovation, one of the latest identities, fresh, uh, you know, it's a, it, one, one of, the, one of the, the freshest ones uh, right out of the oven. It's called Trigender. Watch this. So a couple of people might have been surprised by my transgender pin that I put on this morning. I figured it's about time that I came out and talked about my gender identity. I am trigender, which means like a triangle, I have three genders, male, female, and non-binary. And the difference between trigender and gender fluid is that I feel all three of these genders at the same time. All the time. 
it doesn't ever shift or change or where I feel one gender more strongly than the other, like gender fluid tends to be. Also, I should recognize and accept that a lot of people don't see non-binary as a third gender. They see it as something completely separate from the binary of male and female. Um, but for me, it's like a third gender. Or I guess you could call it a third identity. So how I feel gender-wise is like a man, like a woman, and as neither at the same time. I hope this clears things up, but let me know if you have any more questions. I'm happy to answer. I do have questions, actually, quite a lot. She says she's male, female, both, and neither at the same time. Now, that obviously makes no sense at all. I mean, it's the definition of a logical fallacy. You cannot be something and the opposite of that thing at the same time. It's like identifying as a married bachelor. It is a self-contradiction. So is the girl in the video simply crazy? Is she suffering from mental delusions? It's possible, and appearances would suggest that such is the case, but it need not be the case. What's more likely is that she's simply trying to fit in with the fad and find her own trendy twist on it, but the more that she tries to live in this nonsensical identity, the more confused she will actually become, the more detached from reality, and the more plagued by anxiety at the same time. I mean, keep in mind, as I am always saying, that, that um, you know, the really sinister thing about gender ideology and is that when someone becomes fully enthralled to it, they will have lost grip, not just on reality in general, but on the reality of themselves. And there's a lot that comes from this, and one of those things is anxiety. Because anxiety is the unease that comes from uncertainty. It comes from the unknown. It's why, you know, you don't like uh, walking down into a dark basement at night because you don't know what's down there. And uh, your mind sort of fills in the gaps with all the terrifying possibilities. It's why Joe Biden's handlers become very nervous whenever he steps in front of a microphone because they have no idea what he's going to say or whatever, you know, childhood story he's going to make up. This is all anxiety. So gender ideology is like an anxiety machine because it makes a person's fundamental physical identity uncertain to themselves, creating a sort of unrelenting anxiety. It's no surprise then that Gen Z are reporting record levels of anxiety at precisely the time when these kinds of ideas are gaining prominence. Ideas which in effect turn out the intellectual lights, turning our minds into that dark, scary basement. Which brings me to my third point. Um, I said at the beginning that it's no surprise that Gen Z voted Democrat because so many are diagnosed mentally ill. And uh, I wasn't being facetious there. At least I wasn't being entirely facetious. Facetious. There is a relationship. It does actually make a lot of sense. Because we know with Gen Z, uh, not only does this make them susceptible to, to identity politics and all of that, that the Democrats can exploit. But also, because they have all of this anxiety in their heads, uh, in their minds, and they don't know what to do with it, and they don't know how to cope with it, again, having anxiety is a normal thing. It's part of the human condition. Nobody likes it, but it's part of the human condition. It's one of the things that makes us human is that we can experience anxiety. But the Democrat Party thrives on exploiting anxiety. That's how they motivate people to vote. If you listen to things that Gen Z, you know, their exit poll data, what were they concerned about? Why did they go to the poll to vote? It's things like climate change. You know, they're actually worried about that. They think the world's coming to an end. They think that America is systemically racist, that there are white supremacist murderers walking around out there. You know, uh, it, it, this, is, this is their view of the world. They're full of anxiety. The Democrat Party is able to exploit it and convert that into votes. Which is why, as I've been saying all along, we have a, a long road ahead in this fight for the culture. And the fight is, in, in every sense of the term, generational. Now let's get to our five headlines. You know, if you're listening to this show uh, and you're a parent, odds are that you put a lot of stock in how you raise your kids. You understand that your children look to you to define their values and their perspectives of the world. That's why it's extremely important that you have a will in place. A will determines how your financial assets are dispersed, as well as your personal property. 
It lays, uh, lays out your healthcare power of attorney to ensure that your end-of-life decisions are carried out. And if you're just starting out and you don't have thousands of dollars to spend on an attorney, but you want to make sure your savings, your belongings, and your family are all protected, you have to create a will at epicwill.com today. You don't need a lot of money. In fact, uh, early estate plans start at just $119, and you can save 10% when you use promo code Walsh. All you got to do is go to epicwill.com, use promo code Walsh, to save 10% on Epic Will's complete will package. That's epicwill.com, promo code Walsh. We start with this story from the Daily Wire. It says Sam Bankman Fried, who's the, uh, the now bankrupt founder of the cryptocurrency exchange FTX, gave a staggering sum of money to Democrats and far left causes this midterm election cycle before his multi billion dollar empire imploded this week, which is something, by the way, that happened. So you've got this m- mega Democrat donor um, donated more than anybody else next to George Soros. The Democrat causes, and all of this explodes right after the midterms. Well, we're still in the middle of the midterms, actually, because they haven't even counted all the votes yet. But uh, but right after voting allegedly concluded, uh, that's what all this comes out. De- uh, Daily Wire has more information about this. FTX, which is headquartered in the Bahamas, was launched in 2019 and had accrued more than 1 million users by 2022. Users suddenly demanded $6 billion in withdrawals after an article published by Coindesk revealed last week that the two arms of Bankman Fried's uh, cryptocurrency empire, FTX and Alameda Research, had significant overlap on their balance sheets in the form of the cryptocurrency FTT, which FTX invented. Rival firm Binance, which had been planning to purchase FTX, announced that it would discharge all holdings in the coin and eventually reverse course on the acquisition. The disheveled 30-year-old went from boasting a $15.6 billion net worth to having no material wealth over the span of approximately two days. Federal and state officials are now investigating whether Bankman Fried broke laws with his actions at the company. You would think that he certainly did. Now, uh, so SBF, there are a lot of initials going on here, but you've got SBF, who's the guy that owns FTX, and uh, that is the uh, the that, that's the the organization, the, the company that invented FTT, which is the cryptocurrency. So all these things are confusing, but SBF. Um, was the second largest donor for Democrats this election cycle, only behind, as I said, George Soros. He gave at least $38 million to leftist causes, PACs, and candidates, according to Fox News. Political reported that Bankman Fried was a top resource to whom Democrats went when lawmakers began looking at ways to regulate cryptocurrencies because of his willingness to write multi-million dollar checks to boost Democrats. And the deeper you dive into this relationship between um, SBF And the Democrat Party, the more you find, for example, the Post Millennial has this report. Uh, It says the multi-billion dollar cryptocurrency company FTX run by SBF, the second biggest donor after George Soros collapsed last week. So we know about that. It was revealed that FTX had partnered with Ukraine to process donations to their war efforts within days of Joe Biden pledging billions of American taxpayer dollars to the country. Ukraine invested into FTX as the Biden administration funneled funds to the invaded nation, and FTX then made massive donations to Democrats in the U.S. Uh, A lot of this comes from an article from the cryptocurrency news website Coindesk from March 15th, 2022, reported that Ukraine partnered with FTX and that FTX is converting crypto contributions to Ukraine's war effort into fiat for deposit at the National Bank of Ukraine. Okay. So, if you follow the... uh, the trajectory there, and you connect all the dots, you don't have to connect a lot of them. But Ukraine invested into FTX. FTX is investing into Democrats. And who is investing into Ukraine? In fact, you were, and you still are, whether you like it or not. And I certainly don't. So the Democrat Party, this is interesting, Democrat Party's funneling money to Ukraine which then partners with FTX, and then FTX turns around and gives a lot of money to the Democrats. You might even call that a money laundering scheme. In fact, that's exactly what you should call it. It's like a giant money laundering scheme. And not the only one the Democrats have, by the way. They've got a lot of these things going on, where they funnel money to organizations, and the organizations give money right back to them. Um, you know, 
not not to not to distract from from the FTX scandal, which is massive, but we should also note that this is this has been happening with Planned Parenthood for decades. The Democrat Party gives five hundred million dollars a year to to uh, to Planned Parenthood, and then Planned Parenthood turns around and donates to Democrat causes. And th- and they always have ways of justifying this or getting around it legally. Well, it's easy to get around it legally when nobody. You know, the FBI is not interested in looking into it to begin with. But the way they do it with, with Planned Parenthood is they, they say that, uh, well, but these are, these are, it's, it's, the money's not going, it's, these are all separate areas that the money is going to. You know, the money's not going to fund abortions. Except they're forgetting that the money is fungible. And so if you give money to one aspect of an organization, then you have freed up money in other places where they can, they can then spend how they want. So that excuse doesn't really wash. Democrat Party specializes in this kind of thing, is my point, and that appears to be what's happening with uh, FTX. Now, you know, I just started reading about this last night, and I'm far from an expert on anything crypto-related uh, or on this issue, but it is quite obvious already that the deeper you dig into this, the bigger the scandal becomes. And already, Sam Bankman fried is... You know, he's in the Bernie Madoff conversation at the, just the, 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 uh, the scope of this scam, this Ponzi scheme that he was running. But we're never going to find out the full scope of it unless the media is interested in looking into it. And if the federal government is interested in investigating it which they certainly are not going to be because he was a major Democrat donor. And it should be obvious by now, this is the reason why he was a major Democrat donor. It's actually pretty smart. Um, and it does take intelligence even to run a scam as big as what he was running, even if it, did all, it, it, all, it all did fall apart. It's pretty clear that he was donating to Democrats because he knows they're the ones who run the media, they're the ones who run the government. Even no matter who's in the White, White House, Democrats are still running it. And... Um, when all this blows up, they're not going to be interested in coming after him because they don't want all of these ties to come to light. And what are they going to do? Give the money back? I mean, they should. They're not going to. The other part of this, too, is just cryptocurrency itself. And, and you know, I, I, I said before that I, uh, I don't understand cryptocurrency. I'm not an expert in it. And I've always said that. But I, I've, I'm increasingly coming to, un, to realize that uh, those of us who say, well, I don't really understand the whole crypto thing. It's, we actually do understand it. But it's like our first reaction to it when we first heard about it is that it, it sounds totally arbitrary and fake and made up and, uh, and, and absurd. And so we always assume, those of us who say we can't understand, we assume that, well, there must be something more to it that I'm just not getting. I must not be getting it because... What, what you're explaining to me about cryptocurrency, it just, it sounds like a, just like a, a, a fantasy, just a, a, a bubble floating in the air that can easily pop. And people are putting their money into this, like actual real money. Well, you can, you can invent a digital coin and then just declare that it's worth something. And it's only worth something if everyone else plays along. That's, what, that's what's keeping all this afloat, is that everyone's playing along with it. What happens when they stop playing along? Well, the value plummets. So for a lot of us, that was our first reaction to cryptocurrency. We first heard about it years ago. That's why we didn't get invested. Maybe we assumed that there must be something that we're just not getting. But no, there isn't. There isn't more to it. That really is it. It's just... Uh, it's just it's nothing. It's like something that floats out in the ether. And as long as everyone plays along and agrees to pretend that these, these numbers on a screen mean something, then it will have value. And then the moment that we all say, you know what, I'm not into that anymore, it just plummets to the earth. And I know that the response to that is always, well, that's the same thing with fiat currency. It's the same thing with our money right now. It's, you know, what's happening with inflation? You know, th- th- that only has value because we essentially believe in it. Which, you're right, but then what that tells us is that cryptocurrency, it's not solving any of the problems caused by fiat currency. It has all the same problems, but only worse. It, it magnifies all of those problems. It doesn't solve them. 
It's like you're doubling down on what makes fiat currency unreliable and unstable by coming up with something that's even less reliable and even more unstable. Seems to me we should be going in the uh, other direction. All right. Moving to uh, this also from the Daily Wire says, Republicans will fail to gain enough seats to take back the Senate majority, according to a projection by Decision Desk headquarter. headquarters. The, uh, the Senate will remain under Democratic control since ties are broken by the vice president. The projection came after Decision Desk headquarters called the Nevada race for the Democrats, the partisan makeup of the uh, Senate will be decided after the December 6th Senate, run- Senate runoff between Herschel Walker and uh, Raphael Warnock. Um, which, even if Walker wins that one, it's the, the Republicans at this point will not be able to take control of the Senate because Kamala Harris will still have the tie-breaking vote. Although it's certainly much better to win it than not, obviously, because then you've got the 50-50. We're back to what it was before. And depending on what the bill is, what the legislation is, maybe you can peel Joe Manchin or somebody off. Um, but if uh, Walker loses that race, then, then, you know, that's Joe Manchin's dream come true. Now he's off the hook. It doesn't matter what he does. So it looked like it was trending this direction last week. And this is where we are now. Um, and when I say trending in that direction, you know, it's... Uh, the Democrats kept on counting the votes and kept on counting them until they had won the Senate. That's what I mean by trending in that direction. Um, This from Breitbart, Senator Josh Hawley is calling for Republican Party to undergo reform after it was projected the party would not gain control of the U.S. Senate Saturday night. He said, the old party is dead, time to bury it, build something new. Um, And he said that in reaction to Republican Adam Laxalt losing in the Nevada Senate race. And this is after the the, Demo- the Republicans lost the Senate. This is what most people are saying now. Um, and as far as the House goes, I mean, they're still counting the votes as it stands right now. Somehow they are still counting votes. We're almost a week out and they're still counting them because this is what this is how a modern election is supposed to work, where it takes you a week, week to count the votes. They still have not been able to explain why exactly it takes that long. I've, I've listened to all the press conferences where the people in charge have answered questions and supposedly explained why it takes this long. And I still don't understand why it takes this long. I mean, I think I do understand it, but it's not, it's not an answer that they're going to give out loud. There's no good reason why it should take a week to count the votes. And what they especially have not been able to explain is why can't they go talk to Florida? How do they manage to count, you know, many more votes in a small fraction of the time. They've got many more millions of votes to count. They do it they, they do it in five hours. And it takes you over five days in Arizona, Nevada, et cetera. But this is what Republicans are saying, that uh, we've got to burn the party to the ground, start over. I agree with that. Uh, I absolutely agree, obviously. We need new leadership. As I said, the day after the election, you know, there are, we can, we can spend uh, weeks and months doing the postmortem and, and, uh, and, and debating why the Republicans lost. And there are a lot of things that went into it. One of them, of course, is how these elections are run to begin with. And the fact that it does take a week to quote unquote count them. That's part of it. It's not just that. It's also, as I said, the Republican Party on a national level had no message. I mean, what, what was the Republican party, Party's message? I don't know. I mean, I know their message was Joe Biden is bad. That, that's a fine message. We all agree with that. The voters seem to agree with it, which is why all the exit poll data shows that voters were upset with the direction of the country. They were fearful and anxiety-ridden about the direction of the country. And yet, Many of them still voted for the party that has that is currently taking them in the direction that they say they don't want to go. What does that mean? It means that uh, your message cannot just be a negative of this guy's bad. What you have to be able to explain is why we have a better vision for the country. And here's what the vision is. And they weren't able to do that. So that's that's one of the lessons that we should take from this. But the other question then is what do we do? about this system. You know, Democrats are able to dominate in these states because ballot harvesting, 
mail-in voting, early voting. And I think you, almost any conservative that w- will say that at this point that none of that should be happening. Okay, As I've said a million times, the voting should be on election day with rare exception, active duty military being one of them. Maybe there are a couple others you can name, but with rare exception, voting is on election day. The polls are open from this hour to this hour. You show up there in person, flesh and blood. You walk in there, you cast your vote, and you, pr- you produce your ID, and then you leave. That's the way that it should work. But it's, it's not working that way. And the problem is that Pennsylvania, Nevada, Arizona, how are we going to convince the Democrats that run these states to change the voting procedures to disadvantage themselves? It's just never going to happen. They're not going to do it. You know, we can't say to them, well, this gives you an unfair advantage. Stop doing it. That can be, that can be our, our claim. That's, that's basically what we've been saying as we're kind of impotently whining about it. But that's not going to be a compelling argument to them because the whole point is that it gives them an unfair advantage. They're aware of that. That's why they're doing it. And so how do you, when you don't have power, how do you convince them to change something to take an advantage away from themselves. It's never going to happen. So what can you do? If you really want to change the system, if you want to change the way that uh, that, uh, elections are run in these states, you have to take control. You have to have power in order to do it. And unfortunately, in order to do it, in order to take control of the system, you you have to do that through the system itself. You have to be able to use the system that you want to change. If you want to change a system, you first have to understand how to use it to your advantage and exploit it so that you can take control of it. And then once you've done that, then you can change it. So what we have to decide is, is, uh, as conservatives, we can keep stomping our feet and whining about the early voting and mail-in voting and all the rest of it. And I and I and emotionally I, I fully understand that approach because I hate it also. And we can keep doing that and nothing's gonna change because the Democrats in Pennsylvania and Arizona and Nevada and the other states, they're gonna they're gonna they, they listen to us and they laugh. And that's all they're gonna do. So the other approach is to learn how to is to start exploiting the systems that are in place. I don't think they should have mail-in voting. I don't think they should have early voting, but they do. And so if we ever want to change that or anything else, then we have to learn how to exploit that, how to use that to our advantage. Right. In so many cases now, it seems like Republicans have kind of crossed their arms and said, I don't agree with this, so I'm just not going to take part. Well, we're only hurting ourselves when we do that. And so the Democrats are basically running unopposed. They've created these tools for themselves, and, and, they're, and they've, they have a monopoly on it because we haven't even tried to take advantage of it ourselves, and, uh, and nothing's ever going to change. You have to be able to use the system and learn how to navigate it if you want to take control of it and change it. That's just the reality. All right. What else do we got here? So uh, I thought this was funny. Uh, some some journalists on on Twitter are complaining, you know, because Elon Musk taken over Twitter and uh, and he's already fired a bunch of people, and they're complaining about that. Well, here's the latest from a New York Times article, and a guy a guy named Bill Gruskin tweets this. He says, "Mr. Mu- Mr. Musk plans to begin making employees pay for lunch, which had been free, at the company cafeteria." And then a guy named Andrew Wartman responds to that. He said, "He fired three fourths of the employees. Now he's planning to starve the rest of them." He's failure incarnate. Yes, now the Twitter employees are, and Musk actually responded to this and said that, look, most of the employees don't even come to the office, so I don't think I'm going to starve them to begin with. But also, you know, they're working at, at Twitter. It's, uh, so they, they have jobs. They probably should be able to pay for their own lunches. 
And now it's nice to get a free lunch every day. Don't get me wrong. We actually we get that here at the Daily Wire. They provide us catered lunch every day. It's what's it's, it's it's fantastic if you can get it. But if they were to take that perk away from us, I don't think I would just sit here and starve. I would probably just, you know, you could pack a lunch or go go buy lunch somewhere. So these are these really petty complaints that we're still hearing about the Elon Musk takeover of uh, Twitter. But there are complaints that you could make that are not as petty. So, for example, over the weekend, um, our uh, great reporter, Christina Buttons, here at The Daily Wire, she tweeted out a link to a report that she just did for The Daily Wire. And um, the headline of that report is, New Data Emerges of 1,100-plus Adolescent Gender-Affirming Mastectomies. And then she tweets it with this caption. She says, New Data, a study of nationwide hospital databases found that at least 1,130 adolescents between 2016 and 2019 received gender-affirming chest surgeries, gender-affirming in quotes, chest surgeries in the U.S. An overwhelming majority, 1,114 of the adolescents were female. Um, and so that's it. That's the report. Now, this isn't even an editorial. This is just Christina Buttons uh, presenting the information, the data, which says that over this span, you know, well over a thousand minor girls had their their breasts amputated in in pursuit of this uh, of this aim of becoming a boy, which of course they can never become. Well, if you tried to click on that link on Twitter over the weekend, this is what would have happened. And this is what happened to me when I tried it myself. A, a warning page comes up and it says, warning, this link may be unsafe. It says, the link you're trying to access has been identified by Twitter or our partners as being potentially spammy or unsafe in accordance with Twitter's URL policy. This link could fall into any of the below categories. And then uh, it says it could be a spam, it could be a malicious link that's stealing information, or, of course, it's none of those things, or it could be violent or misleading content that could lead to real-world harm. So if the, if the content is violent or misleading, then this warning page comes up. Now, it does give you an option. There's a, there's a, a, you know, a, a button there at the top that says you can click and go back to the previous page, get away from the unsafe content. Or in smaller letters below that, it says, ignore this warning and continue. And then, then you can get to the article. So factual information about the mutilation that's being inflict, inflicted on children in this country by these so-called gender-affirming doctors, fa that factual information is flagged on Twitter as unsafe, and it could lead to harm somehow. This is actually worse than it was before Elon Musk took over. You know, I don't remember ever seeing a warning page like that pop up for an article like this before. So it's not just that, um, you know, we still have the same wokeness now that Elon Musk, it's, it's, actually, it's actually worse in this way. And that's uh, extremely concerning. Now, you know, I tweeted this out over the weekend. Of the, there, there were people pointing out saying that, hey, we, we need to be a little bit more patient and uh, a little more generous with Elon Musk here. And he did. He just took over the company. He can't fix everything right away. And I, and I understand that. You know, Rome wasn't built in a day and all that. And you certainly can't fix it in a day. But all the same, I mean, as, as I said last week, you know, he, Musk had, did right away institute some major changes. The changes that he made with the verification process, and then they ended up abandoning that after like two days because it was a total disaster. But they did implement major structural changes right away. So it seems as though they could have cleaned a lot of this up right away, and they haven't yet. That doesn't mean they won't in the future. But it does mean that the, uh, the woke brigade is still there at Twitter, and they're still running things to a large extent. And if you really want to change that, I mean, Elon Musk has already ha fired like whatever it is, half of the company. you got to fire, to basically fire almost everyone and build the company over again from scratch to actually fix this problem. All right, this is from the Daily Wire. Also, it says, churches in the United States are struggling to return to attendance levels seen prior to COVID lockdowns um, before that shut their doors and forced online services, according to a new LifeWay research poll. 
The survey released last week was conducted with 1,000 Protestant pastors from September 6th to the 30th from a random sample of Protestant churches. The survey revealed that despite churches failing to return to pre-lockdown levels, um, the majority had resumed in-person worship services. Now, this doesn't surprise me at all as someone, I don't go to Protestant churches, I'm Catholic, obviously, but uh, I have noticed this myself. I think anyone who goes to church every Sunday, we, we all notice this. That, um, and I've been to a bunch of different churches, you know, in, in several different states over the last couple of years, and I've noticed this everywhere, that attendance appears to be significantly lower than it would have been before the pandemic. Um, is that problem going to right itself? I mean, here, here's the question. Are the churches ever going to get back to pre-pandemic levels of attendance? And I'm skeptical that that will happen. I'm skeptical for a few reasons. One is that the culture keeps moving away from us um, as you know, successive generations are more godless, more likely to be atheist. Secularism takes hold of the culture more and more. So you're, you're, already, okay, it's, you're, you're already trying to swim upstream because of that. But then at the same time, and this was my objection at the very beginning, this was my objection to, to churches closing to begin with is that when you do that and you shut your doors, you are, um, you are telling your congregants, you're telling your flocks that you are not necessary. That you, the church, as the church, what you're saying to, to the congregation is that what we're doing here is not necessary. Remember, this was, um, this was during the time that it, it, uh, only, essential, only essential workers were allowed to go to work. All the essential services uh, are allowed to stay open, but all the non-essential services have to be shut down. And state governments, they, they declared that, well, church is a non-essential service. And unfortunately, a lot of churches, and there were some exceptions to this, but a lot of churches went along with that and agreed with it, whether explicitly or implicitly, and said, you're right, we're not, we're not essential. Once you've told your congregation that, once you've advertised that, once you, once you have sent that message, um, you're not going to be able to get them all back. Because I think there were a lot of people who were going to church before that, and the churches shut down, said, well, we're not an essential service, so we, we can stay shut down for as long as, uh, as the government tells us to. Until everyone stops having the sniffles, we can just shut the doors. And there are many churches that stayed shut for months on end, if not longer than that. And then many members of the congregation said, well, apparently you're not essential. Apparently we don't need you. Now you've opened your doors again, but it's, uh, what's the point of going back? I don't agree with that. Church is essential. You know, as we're told in scripture, it's, uh, man does not live on bread alone. You also, you also have to feed yourself spiritually. That is an, that is an essential service. But unfortunately, the, the church has broadcast the opposite message, and that has uh, sunk in. And I don't know if there's ever going to be any undoing that completely. Let's get to the comment section. Daily cancellations are the law and order of the day. Be the sweet baby gang. You know, with everything going on in the world right now, you could really use a, a good night's sleep. I know I could. That's why you need to check out Helix Mattress. I've had my Helix for years now, and I absolutely love it. I sleep like a baby, even in the midst of what's arguably my busiest season, and I've got twins on the way, so I don't know if I'll be doing much sleeping then, but at least I'll be comfortable for the little fits of time when I can sleep. A mattress should never be a one-size-fits-all solution because why should you have to compromise on comfort? Helix has a sleep quiz that matches your body type and sleep preferences to the perfect mattress for you because why would you buy a mattress made for somebody else? So go to helixsleep.com slash Walsh, take their two-minute sleep quiz, and find the perfect mattress for your body and your sleep type. Your mattress will come right to your door for free. Plus, Helix has a 10-year warranty, and you get to try it out for 100 nights risk-free. They'll even pick it up for you if you don't love it, but Trust me, you will. Their financing options and flexible payment plans make it so that a great night's sleep is never far away. So for a limited time, Helix is offering up to $350 off all mattress orders and two free pillows. For our listeners, this is an amazing offer. You can take advantage of it at helixsleep.com Walsh. With Helix, better sleep starts now. 
The mall says, when it comes to voting, we should not have names on the ballots, but rather people have to write them down themselves. That way a voter at least knows how to spell and, has, and uh, knows at least a little bit about the candidate. Obviously, this isn't even close to perfect, but I think it's a start. That's not a bad strategy. I love that idea. I think that's actually a really good idea. Um, now, maybe you wouldn't require that of all the, of the uh, candidates on the ballot, but uh, certainly the candidates at the top of the ticket, and certainly in a, in a presidential election. If it were up to me, yeah, I like that idea, and I would adopt that right away. You actually have to write the name of the candidate that you want on the ballot. And because if you, don't, if, you, if, you, if you can't even do that, like if you need the name to be there ahead of time, because you don't know the names, um, then you know you are voting purely out of ignorance, and you're wor- you are working to undermine the democratic process and and, and harm the country in the po- in the process. So I would agree with you on that. I think that's a great idea, and you have to spell it correctly too. So if you misspell it, then the, the ballot goes out the window, goes in the trash. But. Here's my point. This is this is a, this is a fun kind of like fan fiction thing to indulge in. If we were serious, if we were actually serious about uh, about protecting and preserving our republic, these are the kinds of things we would do. But it's just never going to happen, right? Like that. Of course, what you're suggesting, you're not suggesting it as a as a as a as a strategy that will ever actually be adopted. It's just in an ideal. World, if you if you really wanted to protect your democracy, then these are the sorts of things you might think about doing. And so it's okay to talk about that. I talk about it all the time. We should talk about those things. We, we should talk about what we would do in an ideal scenario, because you have to know what the ideal is so that you know which direction you should be traveling in. But then the next step is to realize that we're not in an ideal scenario. We're living in reality. And so how are we going to navigate? We got the ideal. Right, so we know the direction we want to go, but now we have the reality, and so how do we navigate the reality in a way that brings us at least a little bit closer to that ideal? Uh, David said, "It just occurred to me that Matt Walsh will be wanting to take some time off when his twins are born. Perhaps the Daily Wire could contact the people at Hallmark and bring in his doppelganger to host for a couple of weeks. Just an idea. I would love that. I would do that for sure." Um, and uh, yeah, I'll, I, I certainly will be taking some time off, but uh, I'm not going to pull a Pete Buttigieg, so you don't have to worry about that. Taking six months off from maternity leave. Um, Adam says, Matt, you were talking about dealing with haters and hateful, threatening people at your rallies, etc. What advice would you give on how to deal with people who see it as their mission to hate and ridicule? I've dealt with some of this lately, and as much as I wish it hadn't, it really has rattled my cage. Thanks, SBG for life. Well, the only way to deal with people like that is to realize that their opinion doesn't mean anything. And I know it's a little bit easier said than done, so I can tell you that, and it doesn't mean that you're going to be able to like emotionally adopt that right away. But, but that, is, that, is, that is the only way to deal with such people, is to realize that their opinion simply doesn't matter. And especially if you're doing the right thing, and you're living according to your beliefs, and you're speaking the truth, and you're defending the truth, all the all of the sniping idiots and all the little trolls and vultures who come after you, none of their opinions matter at all. And you, so you have to get to a point of uh, of indifference, basically, to them. I'm not even saying you have to hate them or be angry at them. It's just in, indifferent. And I don't recommend indifference in many diff- in, in 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 very many situations. But this is one situation where indifference is the way to go. You have to be indifferent to what they think. Jamie Jones says, I was an iron worker for many years. In our apprenticeship training, we're required to learn eight or 10 different knots, including the noose slip knot, um, noose slash slip knot. They're easy to make, great for moving things floor to floor in a skeleton building, and they don't bind up. They slip apart, hence the name. The stupidity flowing from the left causes me physical pain. Yeah, there's a lot of comments from people in the construction world who were, uh, you know, agreeing that, in fact, uh, ropes are very common on construction sites. Even things that might look like a, 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 a noose or a slipknot might actually be one, but there are practical applications for that. So that could explain, as we talked about the daily cancellation on Friday, you know, that could explain this 
epidemic of uh, construction sites across the country shutting down for days at a time because somebody finds a, a scary rope and decides that it's a racist symbol. But the other thing about that is I, I have to, again, remind you that um, not only are, are these news stories almost always either hoaxes or some very stupid person is misinterpreting an innocuous rope that's, that was being used for some other reason, that's all true. But also the whole idea that a noose is a racist symbol to begin with is invented. That's invented by the media. It's like they invented the OK sign as a, uh, as a, as a racist symbol. That's a media invention. I mean, yes, nooses in the past um, have been used in racist lynchings. That, that's obviously true. But also, the noose has been used as a, as a method of execution for thousands of years all over the country. All over the world, rather, I should say, for thousands of years. So the idea that it specifically has this one meaning now just uh, doesn't make any sense to begin with. You know, last year we launched our daily news podcast, Morning Wire. In this short period of time, it's become one of the top news podcasts. I suspect it's because Morning Wire gives you only the news you need to know in 15 minutes or less without the manufactured outrage. New episodes are available every morning, seven days a week, and they cover stories other media outlets won't touch. So check out Morning Wire on Daily Wire Plus, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Now let's get to our daily cancellation. Last week, we briefly discussed the latest bout of verbal flatulence from Representative Eric Swalwell, who critiqued the idea that parents should be in charge of their own children's education. As you recall, Swalwell, Swalwell said, please tell me what I'm missing here. What are we doing next? Putting patients in charge of their own surgeries, clients in charge of their own trials? When did we all, when did we stop trusting experts? This is so stupid. And indeed, this is so stupid. Everything you said is so stupid. As we covered, clients are in charge of their representation at trial, and patients are in charge of their surgeries. Now, they may delegate, delegate many of those responsibilities, which is a highly recommended approach, especially when it comes to surgery, but they are still supposed to be the ones in charge, basically, the ones deciding. Um, as for the self-appointed experts, well, many of us stopped trusting them when they shut down society over COVID, um, waged war against our fundamental civil rights, only to spend the next two years slowly admitting that all of their pandemic strategies were based on lies. Some of us uh, may have also stopped trusting them when they started pushing for gender-confused children to get mutilated, castrated, and sterilized. And then there are those of us who never stopped trusting the experts because we never started trusting them to begin with. But these points are all academic because public school teachers are not experts anyway. They are by, by no means experts in the subjects they teach, nor are they experts in teaching necessarily. Some of them may certainly have reached the point of expertise through years of experience, but as a class, as a, as a group, they cannot be called experts, especially because most teachers start teaching before the age of 25. Some of them are as young as 20 or 21. Lots of them are when they start. You can't be an expert in anything at that age. You certainly aren't going to be an expert in teaching kids who are barely younger than yourself. So Swalwell is wrong on every level and from every conceivable angle, as per usual. But the interesting point is that he came out explicitly against parental rights just a day or two after the election. The left has gotten even bolder than usual over the past several days, having decided that the results of the midterms vindicate and validate all of their most extreme talking points. This conclusion is, of course, erroneous, especially when it comes to parental rights of all issues. In fact, Republicans up the ballot may have fared relatively poorly in most states, but as we talked about last week, conservatives in school board races were much more successful. The Daily Wire reports, quote, this week conservatives flipped at least nine school boards in at least six states, Michigan, Maryland, North Carolina, South Carolina, New Jersey, and Florida, giving them conservative majorities, according to two parental rights groups who endorsed many of the victorious candidates. The wins signal that parental rights were a significant factor at the ballot box on Tuesday in Michigan. Four school board candidates in Brandywine, who were endorsed by a parents' right group, rights group called 1776 Project PA PAC, uh, won their races, flipping the board from liberal to conservative. In Maryland, three of their uh, school board candidates won in Carroll County, flipping the school board there to a conservative majority. The 17, 1776 Project PAC claims that it has um, officially flipped 100 school boards since November last year. The group's candidates also won in Oklahoma and Ohio. Another parents' rights group, Moms for Liberty, told the Daily Wire that it notched cl clusters of wins in at least four states. The group flipped at least seven school boards. In North Carolina, 
conservative candidates won in both New Hanover County and Iredale County, flipping both of those school board cons, uh, boards conservatives. In uh, South Carolina, six conservative candidates won in Berkeley County, five won in Charleston County, and another four won in York County, flipping all three school board uh, to the conservative side. Moms for Liberty also said that in New Jersey, three candidates in Cape May County won their elections, flipping that school board conservative. In Florida, two candidates won in uh, Pinellas County, flipping that board conservative as well. So in other words, the left decides at its own peril that parents' groups and parents' rights are a losing political issue. Uh, the results indicate actually the, exactly the opposite of that. Republicans only lost on the issue of parental rights if they chose not to run on it in the first place, and many of them made that choice. You can't win the argument if you don't make the argument. And the argument for parental rights is very easy to make, and it will automatically resonate with the vast majority of parents. That's the thing about us parents. Whether we identify with the political left or right, we don't like it when someone tries to parent our children for us. Somebody should tell that to the National Education Association Teachers Union, which also decided after the election that they now have political permission to explicitly attack parental rights. So on Friday, the NEA tweeted this, quote, educators love their students and know better than anyone what they need to learn and to thrive. Better than anyone, they say. Now, the phrasing there is quite deliberate, obviously. The teachers' union is claiming that teachers know better than parents what their children need. But that is, of course, exactly wrong. It is the opposite of reality. In fact, the very best argument for homeschooling is that parents, not public school teachers, are experts in the most important field. Now, most parents, just as most teachers, don't have PhDs in math or science or any other academic discipline, but they are experts on one thing, which is their children. They're experts on their children. Parents know or should know their own children better than anyone. So the NEA accidentally raises a good point here. The most effective educator is going to be the person who knows the child best, who understands him, who knows what he needs and can tailor the education to fit those needs. And that last step is very important because even if a public school teacher um, does come to understand a child's educational needs, which is a big if, considering that the teacher will likely have 20 or 30 other students in the class, only about 45 minutes in a day to teach them any given subject. So it's very difficult to get to know any of the kids. But, but even if the teacher does, um, he, he's not gonna have, he will have only a very limited ability to respond to the child's needs, even if the teacher comes to understand what those needs are. A teacher can't give 30 different kids their own personalized and customized educational environment. It's impossible. And that's not because of the teacher's personal limitations, but rather it's because of the way the system is set up. A worker on an assembly line probably doesn't have, probably doesn't have the ability to make the product by hand. But even if he does, he can't do that while working on the assembly line. The public school system is an assembly line. The teachers are simply manning their stations along the conveyor belt. And even if they man them well, and many of them do, there's only so much attention they can give to each child as he is ferried on down the line. So, yes, it is important in education to know the child well and to be able to respond, to know his needs, and to be able to respond to those needs. And that's why the parent is going to be in a much better position. And then what about love? Well, public school teachers may love their students in a broad and sort of charitable sense, right? But they will not and cannot love the student the way that a student's parents can and should, and most of the time do love him. My, my wife and I, we've been with our children since they were born. We feed them and put clothes on their backs. We uh, care for them when they're sick. We're the ones checking under their beds for monsters before we tuck them in at night. You know, We know them and love them more than anyone ever could. And that does make us better equipped to educate them. Because education is not simply about passing along information, after all. It's not merely a matter of memorizing details and being able to repeat them. That's, that's supposed to be just a part of education. But education as a whole, properly understood, is supposed to be about making someone a better person. Now, our, our educational system right now may often have the opposite effect these days, especially at the college level. But a proper education does mean or should mean instilling virtue. 
And that requires care. That requires patience. Um, that requires love. Which is why the parent should not only be involved, but should, in fact, be in charge. And that is why today the NEA Teachers Union is canceled. And that'll do it for this portion of the show as we move over to the members block. Hope to see you there. If not, talk to you tomorrow. Godspeed.